You're uh, the fuel, your beryllium boron fuel. No, no, it's a hydrogen boron. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, how much energy? How... What is the pass of actually producing the fuel off of this? Well, I'll give two answers. One is what's the cost now and what's the cost of mass production? We know the cost of mass production is very low. Because, first of all, these are very abundant materials. If we convert the entire energy consumption of the world to hydrogen boron, we would have to increase the production of boron by 10%. So it hardly even matters to the boron industry. We know it's cheap to produce because early in the history of the uh, space program, the United States government considered decaporane as a chemical fuel for rockets, and they produced tons of it. So we know it's pretty cheap to produce in mass production. Right now, it's quite expensive because there's no demand for what we need. We asked uh, companies to produce isotopically pure decaborane, that is, with no B10. We wanted to avoid the B10 because if we get this to net energy, the B10 would produce, by a fusion reaction, beryllium-7. Beryllium-7 is radioactive with a half-life of two months. So that's too long to wait out, and it's, too sh it's so short that it's highly radioactive. So we didn't want any of that. So we got a Russian company and a Czech company to collaborate to produce 100 grams of isotopically pure decaborane for $600 per gram. But this was strictly because they were producing it by hand in a laboratory, not a fa in a factory. Then Syed, my colleague, Dr. Syed Hassan, realized uh, why should we, we be using this precious fuel when we're doing experiments that aren't producing enough fusion for us to even detect? So he looked up the standard non-isotopically pure decaborane with 80% as much, as much of the fuel, and it's 10 times cheaper. It's again produced just by laboratories, not uh, mass production. So naturally, we're now using the $50 a gram uh, version. And that's pretty good because even though $50 a gram sounds expensive, each shot is about two-tenths of a gram. So you're talking about $10 per shot. And our time is much more expensive than that. So even now, when we have no mass production, the fuel is not really a significant cost. And with mass production, it will be totally insignificant because remember, you get a million times as much energy from a gram of decaborane as from a gram of gasoline. So, no. How many years do you think it'll take for this methodology to be used for producing energy? Right. Yeah, that's a tough question because. If you look at the history of fusion, pretty much all fusion researchers, and I'm afraid I have to include myself, have been overly optimistic about time. So I thought that this project would take, you know, three to five years for the research phase. It's taken triple that so far. So it's very difficult to estimate. One thing we've changed is estimating the number of shots it takes. That's much more accurate. And so far, we put this on our website, so far we're pretty much on track. We thought that it would take 800 shots to get from the first beryllium electrodes to 100 joules of boron. And I think we're still on track to achieve that. So 
Let me basically say, if everything goes well, and if we get enough funding, which at the moment we're not, but if we get enough funding, we expect to get net energy within the next 18 months. And we expect that with this much larger amount of money, $150, $200 million, we could get a prototype generator working by the end of the decade. So if we get a prototype generator working by the end of the decade, since the amount of capital needed is far less than for existing energy sources, we think a transition to a fusion-based economy would take about 15 years. So before the middle of the century, we would uh, basically get rid of oil and gas as an energy source. Right. So chemically, boron is essential, is, is an essential nutrient for all life, both animals like ourselves and for plants. For plants, you, it's dangerous to have too much. And that's one reason that desalination plants have to be designed to take boron out of seawater. So if we ever run out in the far future of boron in the ground, we can go to seawater and we'd have approximately 3 billion years of energy at present rates of consumption. So this really is unlimited energy. So boron is necessary to us. Decaborane is a specific compound of boron and hydrogen. That's not good for us. It is somewhat toxic, but not very. And if you measure toxicity per unit energy, it's much, much less toxic than gasoline and, and oil. So we've had no problems dealing with it in our small lab. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And any other question? Yeah. Or not really that one. Zoller, I can do the uh, author, says that there's a late and mafia that's operating globally. Uh, you all have to do well that's the that's one of the if you look at the social impact of having a focus fusion based economy, one of the things you can do we've had the the military confrontation with Iran. you could put a lock on every uranium mine in the world, and there aren't that many of them. And uranium would simply go out of existence because really there isn't a lot of use for uranium. Not sure there is. Yeah, there isn't a lot of use for uranium other than the fission in in industry. And fission would become totally uneconomic. It would be very much more expensive than focus fusion. So that proliferation would be completely out of existence. And people ask, could this device be used for any military use? And basically, my response is, well, obviously, dual use is impossible to eliminate. If you can use this to drive a ship, you can use it to drive a warship. But as a weapon, you know, while it weighs three tons, you could drop it on somebody's head. But there is no way, and I want to emphasize this because there have been a lot of movies, quite a few, that use the plot device of a fusion generator being converted into a hydrogen bomb. That was a plot device of a Batman movie. That is utterly and entirely physically impossible. This machine, if something goes wrong with it, it stops. And that would be a problem for an energy production. But there is no way that this could be either converted into a bomb or could have a meltdown accident. The amount of energy in this machine at any given time is of the order of 100 kilojoules, which, as I say, is literally peanuts or pistachios, if you prefer them like I do. Yes. Yeah. So from what you've said, 
it looks like money is one of the bottlenecks that you have to move forward. <laughs> so my question is, if this technology is as promising as you have painted it to be, why would there be not lots of people wanting to invest in it? Right. In other words, if you're so smart, why ain't you rich? Right. Okay. There's two big reasons for that. One reason is we decided long ago to set up our firm so that we do not sell voting shares. The only reason for this is to prevent a hostile takeover. It does not take a financial genius to realize that if we succeed, we will be worth far more dead than alive to the oil companies. The oil companies would pay any amount of money to suppress this technology. This is not hypothetical. When I was looking for work when I first left school, one of the first jobs offered to me in Washington was at a library of Chevron. And my job, as it was described when I was offered it, was to uh, review the patents that would be relevant to the oil industry. And I said, oh, I get it, so that we would start winnowing down the ones that would be interesting for Chevron to develop. And he said, no, not generally. Generally, we're interested in the ones that uh, we want to buy to suppress them. Because remember, this is totally illegal. It's not illegal to suppress technology, to slow that technology down, to increase profit. That's the way capitalism operates. But in this case, we have to avoid that at all costs. Not being able to buy voting shares means that 99.9% .9 of VCs, vulture, venture capitalists, will not touch us. So that leaves out that. Not being able to control pretty much eliminates billionaires as well. In the early stage of the uh, project, I probably talked to 22 dozen people, all of which were had high enough net wealth to write me a check for the entire project. And the amount of money we got from them wouldn't have gotten me on the subway because they all wanted to, to control. That's, they wanted their own toy. We see this in the fusion industry. Uh, Peter Thiel has Helion. Uh, Paul Allen was, who's now passed away, was one of the initial investors in TAE. We don't have a billionaire because so far we haven't had one that doesn't demand control. And then there's a secondary issue, which is thems that have gets. If you look at the coverage of the fusion industry in the mass media, it is very explicitly covering those that have the most investment, not those who have the best results. And if you just look at the rankings, they are ranked by total investment. So we're not going to be in the total t top 10 by total investment. When science journalists say, hey, this is an exciting story, you know, company in the garage doing better, we're actually in a storage facility, doing better than multi-billion dollars, that's a great story, it's killed by the editors. The editors say, this is a business story. Fusion is being covered as a business story, not a science story. So because we don't have mass media coverage, People ask the same question. Well, if you're doing so good, why don't I read about it in the Times? We do, we are working on sol solving these problems. For one thing, we think eventually our results will get published in such a way that people can't ignore them. Uh, we are reaching out to uh, various people who do have high uh, net value. Crowdfunding can finance us if we reach enough people. So we're fine-tuning the way to reach a bigger audience. But the, the key issue of maintaining control is probably the 
the biggest, the biggest issue we have, and we really can't change that. Our video has come out of LPP Fusion's research in fusion energy, the energy which will power a future of abundance for all, with a sustainable economy and a clean environment. Goods, housing, and transportation will be affordable to all once fusion kicks in. Fusion energy is the key to building a better world now. Support fusion research, $10 a month at lppfusion.com support. The link is in the description. Thanks.